Okay, so I will start. So today we are going to read the second chapter, which is a chapter on uh, proving that the Mahayana teachings are teaching by the Buddha. This is in a way interesting chapter uh, because, but, but, but you see what you need to know is, it's not only the Mahayana teaching, but also the, the teachings given by Buddha before the spread of Mahayana. So how can you prove all those teachings as teachings taught by the Buddha? This is a very, very important and difficult question. Okay. Now, the one thing that um, you, you need to do your personal study, you know, there's not much to explain. But what you need to do is this question is raised by the primarily by some non Buddhists and also the first two Buddhist schools of thought, the Vyabhashika and Sotantika. You know, so they were asking the question that these Mahayana teachings are not taught by the Buddha, these are not teachings of the Buddha because of this, 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 these reasons, okay? So, so this has been answered, proving that these Mayana teachings are teachings taught by Buddha. But what I'm telling you is to see it in a larger perspective, not only the Mayana teaching, of course you can question whether the Mayana teachings are teachings by the Buddha, or even those teachings prior to Mayana teachings, are the teachings of the Buddha, how will you prove it? Okay. And not, not only that, for example, <laughs> sometimes, you know, simple things, you know, people make it very complicated. Sometimes complicated things can be made very easy. But if you make a simple thing complicated, then they will call you a scholar. You know, he's a great scholar, you know. <laughs> but if you explain something very complicated in very simple language, then people may not give much attention to you. So this is an interesting human way. So, so the, the key question that is answered, you know, of course we'll read the text, but the key question that is being asked is, for example, if I meet one of you today on the street, okay, then I say a lot of things and you don't record it and don't write it. Then we take our own way and then you meet someone else. Then you tell that person that this is what Geshe Lakdola said. So how are you, how are you going to prove it? <laughs> You can only say, yes, yes, maybe you can take some oath. I swear that he, <laughs> trust me that he said it, things like that, you know. So, so through this, what I'm saying is, in a way, it's very simple, you know, there are many things which we cannot, you know, show evidence and prove, but it, it functions on trust, you know, when there is no, no reason for people to lie. And uh, then the content of the subject matter also seems sensible, then, then you, you have to accept it, you see, things like that. So it's something like that, whether it's Mahayana teaching or any other teaching. And the problem, this question, one reason that this question is asked is uh, because from the perspective of uh, the, the, the lower Buddhist schools of thought, the Mahayana teachings are a little bit odd to them, especially the concept of Shunyata and so forth are very difficult to digest. So therefore, they are, they are saying that these, these are not taught by the Buddha. That's one reason that they ask. Now, today people might be asking this question whether Mayana teachings are taught by Buddha or not, because there's not much, you know, uh, there, there's no, no writing at the time of the Buddha. So in that case, it is not only the Mayana teaching, but other teachings also, you know. So, so there was no writing. And now this problem is not only with Buddhism, but it's also the same problem with Christianity, you know, Judaism and so forth. When when these original you know teachings were taught, there were there was no writing, there was no recording, things like that. So these these issues are there. So so here, so so I, I'm just giving you the hint, you know, how to how to solve this problem. And uh, so let us read the text because you know this text is a long text. So if we you know get too digressed, we may not be able to proceed much. Okay, so in this, in this text, what you need to do is after the Buddha passed away, then many of the Wisdom Perfection Sutras are said to be taken to the realm of Naga, Naga land, okay, to the, the area of Nagas. And also certain damages were done to the Buddha's teaching. And most of the, the Mahayana you know, Sutras were got 
uh, lost because they most of them were invited to the land of Nagas and so forth. And uh, so it was Nagarjuna who you know brought this wisdom perfection sutras from the from the land of the Naga, and then he himself composed those uh, uh, those texts like Ratnavali, you know, the, the fundamental wisdom and so forth. The six six famous texts is written by Nagarjuna. Okay, so as I said, now here the in the in the in the in India, then the Vebhishikas and Southern Tikas they they were asking this question that the the Mahayana Sutras, when they saw this Mahayana Sutras, then they were saying this is not teaching of the Buddha. Because, and this is not teaching of the Buddha, and these are what you are claiming as teaching of the Buddha are later fabricated by uh, non, non Buddhist logicians whose aim was to specially destroy Mahayana teaching. Okay, so that is, that is what, what they said. And, and also that this, this came into being. Uh, when, when the Buddha taught the, the uh, text is about the Sarvakas and then he passed away. So Mayan teachings came only after that. So that is also now uh, questionable. And then this no, these teachings do not go well with the Sutra and it's not found in the Vinaya and it also contradicts the, the, the ultimate truth. So these are the reasons that they put forth. And because of this suspicion about the authenticity of the Mayana teaching, as I said, Nagarjuna on the one hand went to the land of Naga and brought uh, many of the Wisdom Perfection Sutras. Then on the other hand, we have uh, uh, Arya Asanga, who you know, tried to get a direct vision of Maitreya and meditated for 12 years. And then he was able to gradually get the direct vision of Maitreya and went to the, the, the joyous land. And then he composed uh, got this teaching of the five sets of discourses by Maitreya, and uh, then especially by relying on the Sutra Alam Mahayana Sutra Alamkara and the uh, two uh, other texts, uh, he uh, he pioneered. He started the the uh, the uh, mind only school tradition. Okay, and. Uh, So in other words, Nagarjuna interpreted Maitreya's Uttara Tantra in accordance with the uh, Madhyamika system. And he was therefore treated as one of the pioneers, trailblazers. And, uh, and Asanga, as I said, uh, was the pioneer or trailblazer of the Mayanuli school of thought. So now what is being said here in this particular verses, which we are going to read is, what is being told to us or to the followers is to refute these wrong views about Mahayana. And therefore it's encouraging us, you should never abandon these precious Mahayana teachings. And uh, to do that, we need to refute the reasons the reasons uh, by which people are saying that these are the no, not Mahayana teachings. So first, certain reasons are being put. One reason that, that is being put here is that as we read the verse number one, uh, those who say that these are not the Mahayana teachings, that they say that this is if this is a Mayana teaching, then Buddha, before passing away, he should have made a prophecy saying that at, at such a such a time, the Mayana teaching will uh, will come. So such a prophecy was not, not given. Uh, sorry. Uh, so this is actually a reputation against the Tirthikas, the non-Buddhist schools of thought. Okay, who said that this is no, not Mahayana teaching? So I, I misinterpreted a little bit. So, so in response to this, what is being said is, if these are, you know, teachings made by some non-Buddhist logicians to harm the teaching, 
then the Buddha should have made a prophecy long before that such a such a thing happened. So such a prophecy has not been made. This is reason number one. So therefore, this is my own teaching. Because it is not been prophesied. Second, it came at the same time. That means it is not correct to say that the Mahayana teachings came later than the teachings to the Sarvakas. Okay? Because these teachings came at the same time. In all those same places to the same followers where the discourses for the Sarvakas were given, at the same time, the Mayana teachings were also given. For example, at one particular place, the Sarvaka teachings may be given. In other place, like the Grija Kuti, the vulture speak, the Wisdom Perfection Sutra was taught. There's one thing. Then, to the question that these are not taught by Buddha, but these were created by some, you know, theoreticians, some, 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 some logicians, so this is reputed by saying that these are not created by some, some non-Buddhist logicians because if you look at the text, you know, this text is so profound and so vast. So therefore it is really, this text is not the field of engagement. That means this is not something that the, uh, the non-Buddhist logicians can understand. It is not their object of understanding. Is the third reason. Okay. Now, as a response to this, if you say that some logicians who, who were not only logicians, but who had also personalized and actualized spiritual grounds and spiritual path, and then got enlightened and then composed it. If you come with such a rebuttal, then this is answered by saying that in that case, this is the teaching of the Buddha, because it is taught by somebody who got enlightened. So therefore, this, the, the next one, it says, it is established. That means then it is proved, you are accepting that this is something that is taught by the Buddha. Then it, next line says, the third line says, its existence or non-existence leads to existence or non-existence. That means, if there is something called Mahayana teaching, then it is reasonable to talk about many of other Mahayana teachings, which are a result of the turning of the second wheel of the doctrine and so forth. But if there is not even one example of Mahayana teaching, then this amounts to say that there will be no Buddha who got enlightened by practicing these Mahayana teachings. If there, there is no Buddha, then forget about the teaching of Mahayana. The other teachings, the so-called teachings taught by Buddha will also, also be not, not be there because there is no Buddha for giving any teaching. Okay, so that is the, the existence and non-existence leads to existence or non-existence, right? Then it is the counter force and interpreted for others. Now it is the counter force means The opponents say that these teachings are, you know, made by some theoreticians because it doesn't show the antidote to negative emotions. So this is, you know, answered by saying that of course this this shows the counterforce to afflict emotions because it it teaches the most profound and extensive teaching, and uh, through that it ripens the mind of sentient beings and also liberates them. And of course, it helps sentient beings to get rid of the both obscurations, the obscurations, the afflictive obscurations and the cognitive obscurations. So therefore, this definitely is not only an antidote to the afflictive emotions, but it shows the complete counterforce and the antidote to afflictive emotions. And then, one point that I raised at right in the beginning, one main reason which uh, by which they say this is not taught by Buddha. And even these days, there are people who misunderstand the meaning of emptiness. And therefore, they say that Mahayana is nihilism. So they may say this is not taught by Buddha. 
they may also say this is nihilism because it talks about emptiness. Emptiness for them means nothingness. So this is uh, refuted by saying, even in places where you find the statement that all things do not exist, this should not be taken literally. It is not saying that things do not exist at all, but it means things do not exist independently. So this, therefore, these are interpretative teachings which must be understood. So this, these eight points are said to be the eight important points that is, establishes Mayan teaching as the authentic uh, teaching taught by the Buddha. And then each of these, some of these important points are again like established in, in verse number two and so forth. Now again, they try to refute this by saying that if you think that even 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 if it is harmful to the teaching of the Buddha, but it is not necessary that the Buddha would Buddha would make a prophecy right in the beginning that such and such teaching will come, which will be harmful to the teaching. There is no no guarantee, no certainty that such a prophecy should be made. So this is how they again try to refute. Now, this is answered by saying, in the case of the completely enlightened Buddha, if he sees something which is a great threat to the teaching of the Buddha, he will not remain indifferent. The reasons are, one, that he is an omniscient person, so it is impossible that he would not know it. And when he knows it, it is also impossible that he will remain indifferent. And it's also, because he is omniscient, it's also not possible that, that he will not know what time such things will come, you know, happen. So, so because, because he knows all these things, and uh, therefore he has this kind of direct perception. So this is the first line of the second verse. Buddha's, Buddha poses direct insight, meaning sees things directly what is going to happen in all the time in the future. So it's not that they, the Buddha will not know it. Okay. And then also guards the teachings. That means that as far as his teachings, which is based on his internal realizations are concerned, that he achieves enlightenment by undergoing three countless eons of practice. So such a precious teaching which he had, for which he had worked so hard, he would not just discard it and let it go like that. So therefore he would really use his sublime activity and uh, guard it. He will not remain indifferent. And then, of course, he is somebody who knows all the three times, past, present, and future. So his, his enlightened mind is not obscured by the differences in time. So therefore, it is improper to say that he will remain indifferent. Also, the time is not obscured by ignorance. That is what I already mentioned. Hence, it is improper to say that he will remain indifferent. Verse number three. This is further clarification of the lines that we read in verse one. Its existence or non-existence leads to existence or non-existence. Now this, again here, they try to answer this by saying that there's no need to have a separate Mahayana teaching because the, 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 the Sarvakayana vehicle itself is actually a kind of Mahayana which will make you achieve enlightenment. So this is answered by saying, in the case of the Sarvakayana vehicle, it is definitely not a Mahayana teaching, which will fulfill the twin purposes, one's own purpose and other purposes. Because it is incomplete, 
verse number three, it starts by saying, because it is incomplete, meaning that the Sarvakayana vehicles do not show the complete processes of elimination of obscuration to enlightenment or the cognitive obscuration, because it is incomplete. In the Mahayana teaching, not only there is a complete process by which one can achieve enlightenment, but it also shows a quicker path. Now, especially if you go to the tantric teaching, then of course, even quicker path is there. So those paths are not there in the Sarvagayana vehicle. And of course, in the Sarvagayana vehicle, we have teachings on the spiritual grounds and the perfections and methods and wisdom and so forth. But these are not similar to what is taught in the Mahayana teaching. Because in the Mahayana teaching, we have those vast and extensive deeds of Bodhisattva, which is totally dedicated for becoming Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So therefore, uh, in that sense, the Sarvakayana, Maha, Sarvakayana vehicles are really not the, the direct or the actual method to get that enlightenment, actual method. Of course, indirectly it will help, but not the direct method, okay? Because it is complete, ah, incomplete, that's the meaning. And contradictory. Contradictory means, this is contra contradictory to this quicker path of the Mahayana teaching, because number one, it is not the, uh, and contradictory, it is not the means, sorry, uh, sorry, we already, did, because it is incomplete and contradictory, it is not the means and has not taught so. This Sarvaka vehicle is not the, not, not, not to be known as the Mahayana teaching. Okay, this we already explained. Now, the further reason that this is contradictory is that which is inferior because of it is contradictory thought or expression, meaning that in the, in the case of the, the uh, I don't want to use the word Hinayana, but the, the lower vehicle, in the case of the lower vehicle, the attitude of thought, thought is simply for personal liberation, not for the liberation of all sentient beings. So the thought contradicts, contra contradicts the Mayana thought which is to benefit all sentient beings. Similarly, because of such a thought, what is being taught is also of similar nature. So this contradi contradicts what is being taught in the Mayana teaching. And because of such thought, because of such teaching, then the, then the effort that they make is also of similar type, just for oneself. So therefore, again, this is contradictory to the Mayana teaching, okay? because of it is contradictory thought, teaching, and practice. Practice means effort. And reliance. Reliance means they will rely primarily on the ways of accumulation of merit as is taught in the, 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 the lower school. Not, they will not rely on the, the teachings taught in the, the Madhyamika school or a higher school, Mahayana school. So therefore, the reliance, in terms of reliance also, it is contradictory to the way it should be done in the Mahayana teaching. And then time, time also, they may be able to achieve liberation uh, in three lifetimes and so forth. So again, in terms of time also, there will be differences. So there's the meaning that that which is inferior because of it is contradictory thought, contradictory teaching, contradictory effort or practice, contradictory support or reliance, contradictory time. Therefore, this is inferior comparing to the Mayana teaching. Then the next, they again try to refute by saying that the, the so-called Mayana teachings do, do not have the features or characteristics of teaching of a Buddha. That's what they try to say. So this is, therefore they say, as we already read, that this is not something 
you know, that goes well with the sutra. It is not found in the Vinaya monastery discipline. It contradicts the 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 uh, teaching on suchness. So now this is refuted by saying that because it engages in its own, meaning that there is no such fault as you are trying to highlight in the case of the Mayana teaching. Because in the Mayana teaching, there is an extensive teaching on the precepts and trainings of a Bodhisattva. Therefore, it definitely engages with the Sutrayana. It goes well with the Sutrayana. And then it focuses on how to do away with cognitive obscuration or how to do away with the, uh, the misconceptions, which of course is one of the fundamental you know, cause for the afflictive emotions. So not only it you know, shows a path to train your mind in general, but it shows a much more profound path to train your mind in such a way so that you're able to completely eliminate afflict emotions. So therefore, this is in conformity with the Vinaya teaching. And then in terms of the subject matter, as we already discussed, the subject matter is really profound because it teaches the subtlest concept of shunyata or emptiness. In the lower schools, they don't even talk about the, the, the emptiness of the phenomena. They talk about emptiness of person, but not of the phenomena. But in the mind only school of thought and the Madhimika school of thought, whether it's the Savatantrika Madhimika or Parsangika Madhimika, they, they talk about the, not only the selfless, selflessness of person, but also talk about selflessness of phenomena. Number one. So therefore, uh, the subject matter is very profound. Not only the profound part is there, but also there is a very extensive skillful method, right? So therefore, it does not contradict the, the suchness of the ultimate reality. So this is what is said here. Because it engages in its own, means in its that the things that is taught in the Mahayana teaching, just as the Sarvaka vehicles, they say that it is in conformity with the Sutra, in conformity with Vinaya and so forth. So similarly in the Mahayana teaching, in its own teaching also, there is a similar pattern of going in harmony with the Sutra, uh, in harmony with the Vinaya, and in harmony with the way things are. Because it engages in its own, it is found in its own Vinaya, and because of its profundity and vastness, it is not contradictory to suchness. Verse number, that's the meaning of verse number five. Verse number six. <clears throat> now, the verse number six is response to those who say, you will recall that earlier we said that these profound Mayana teachings are not filled of engagement of the, the, the theoreticians or logicians. So this is, uh, they try to repeat this by saying, I don't accept this because uh, the, the, the meaning taught in Mayana can be understood just by dry intellectual knowledge. So I have a question here, maybe you can answer later on, not now. <laughs> <clears throat> a scientist, for example, say Einstein or anybody who is really, really sharp, you know, they also analyze the nature, the subtlest nature of many things, right? Be it the subtlest nature of atoms or, you know, they talk about the, the, the quantum reality or, you know, artificial intelligence or the theory of relativity, whatever, you know, there are so many aspects of reality that they talk about. So through this way, when they go deeper and deeper and search, do you think they will be able to realize emptiness without following any of the Buddha's teachings? 
So this is my question. You don't have to answer right now, but think about it. Because on the one hand, it really looks like it is possible because the law of nature is the law of nature. Anybody should have access to it. <laughs> ultimate, you know, ultimate truth or shunyata is, uh, is also nothing but law of nature, right? The ultimate law of nature. So therefore, anybody who has that, you know, capacity, sharpness and effort to, you know, go into it, they should be able to realize. There, there may be no need to become a Buddhist to realize it. Or is it necessary that you become a Buddhist to real, realize emptiness? For example, this opponent is, is saying that the, the content and the meaning taught in the Maya and the teaching should be, can be understood by, by logicians simply asking reasons who may not be believer in my number, they can understand it. Now, look at this answer here. In the answer it says, this Mayana teaching is not the field of engagement of the dry logicians because these logicians will not directly perceive emptiness because this these logicians, what they know is what they, what access they have to some of the scriptures. So they just dry, rely on the scriptures, the quotations from the scriptures, and then put forth, you know, pro, pros and cons, some question answers. And then based on that, they make a decision and make a promise and make a thesis. Now, this is interesting answer. You see, what, what this answer is really saying is just by sharpness of mind, just by intellectually asking many, many questions, you may not be able to, you may get some sense of direction, but you may not, not be able to realize it directly. So again, the question is, what is really needed more than making effort? What is really needed to realize emptiness directly? So this is almost like a second question, you see. Mm. So therefore, so here it says, logicians are dependent. The reason that logicians, mere theoreticians and logicians will not be able to realize, you know, the Maya and the teaching because logicians are dependent. Dependent means they're dependent on some of the, the texts that they read, the quotations that they read, and then like a parrot, they would repeat it, right? And then they would come up with some reasons, pros and cons. So they're dependent. They're, they're, they're a promise, their decision is made on certain external factors. So therefore, they are very susceptible to change their thesis. This is what the scientists, I'm not complaining scientists, but this is really what is happening with the scientific community, you know. In a way, it is good because they are, they are, they are, their theories and ideas are changing all the time. So there is this flexibility. But on the other, other hand, there is no definite course, determined course. Once I attended a scientific conference in New Delhi, with the Russian scientists. And I remember this very well. We had a discussion something on this, something like this. So somebody, at that time, somebody raised this question by saying, I mean, in the case of Buddhists, they always follow the same thing, said the same thing, you know, there is no improvement. There's no improvement. And look at us with the scientists, we, we keep on improving, you know, changing all the time. So he said this on the first day. I did not like respond, not just me, there are many. On the second day also, he said this. Then I just said something in response, which may be right, which may be wrong, but I don't know, but something that I said at the time. I said, the scientists in a way good, you keep on changing, but in a way, because you have no sense of 
actual direction, you know. So you go here, go there, you know, then you find the loopholes and then you again change it like that. But the teachings that we follow, which is taught by Buddha, is so authentic and so definitive that we do not have to change all the time. If there is a need to change it, then of course, after Buddha, how many great teachers like Nagarjuna and so forth have come? They are not stupid. They are also very intelligent. They, 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 they could have refuted it. They could have changed it and taken a new path, you see. But such things not happen, you know. So these are, these are like areas we really need to think about. Just like the, you know, we are, we, we are talking about realizing emptiness directly or not directly, something like that. So these are important questions, okay? So logicians are dependent and uncertain. So, so because they, they did not, you know, realize things directly, they were merely relying on quotations and texts and what people say, you know. And next time, if they read another book which is more convincing, if they listen to a speaker which is more convincing, they'll immediately change it. So therefore, they're dependent and uncertain. They'll change it. Easily they'll change it. Today they'll say something, tomorrow they'll say something. Right? So therefore, a very important thing that's repeatedly said in Buddhism is, whatever you study, not only just follow the quotations, but reflect, confirm it by your self. That's why we need this threefold process of listening, thinking, and meditation. So that you are able to confirm it and develop a conviction which doesn't have to change all the time. Right? These are very important points. And does not cover, means does not pervade to all phenomena. Meaning that what, what they have what they have no, known does not apply to all phenomena. There's a limited knowledge. For example, the, the genuine authentic knowledge on Shunyata, I mean, this is my interpretation, but the text also simply says it does not pervert, you know, so whatever that means. But my understanding, if I'm wrong, please forgive me, but my understanding is when it says that it does not cover all phenomena, it means many of these teachings, for example, the, the shunyata, nature of shunyata, it covers all phenomena. Shunyata is the ultimate nature of all phenomena. You see. Something like that, probably. And then, does not cover, and conventional. Conventional means, their focus is primarily on what they are able to see. The conventional truth. Not much beyond it. And this is, of course, very true in our ordinary, in the case of our ordinary people, because we are, as I said repeatedly, that we are primarily lost in what we see through our senses. Forget about genuine wisdom, <laughs> but we don't keep much opportunity, even to the mental consciousness, you know, to realize the reality through reflective process. We don't do that. We simply follow what you perceive through the senses. So therefore, in the scientific community, they say, why, why do you need a sixth sense? When we talk about sixth sense, they, they think it is a mystery. You know, that's why they made this film called Sixth Sense, you know. And once, once we were having a you know, scientific exhibition on the five senses, see, the monks and the scientists, they were preparing this exhibition. And uh, so one morning when I was going around, I saw that they are making this exhibition on the five senses. Then I told the students on, and also the scientists that why don't you make it, you know, exhibition on the six, six senses. And one of them, one of the scientists told me why you need a sixth sense. Then I explained it and then we made their exhibition on this, you know, uh, six senses. So six sense means the mental consciousness in, in, in addition to the you know, <clears throat> other senses. 
So that's a big problem again, because the, today the world is suffering because we are so focused only on the sensual objects, not beyond it. That's why in Buddhism we talk so much about the need to have meditation, mindfulness, and so forth. Okay? Conventional. Because it is conventional. And exhausted. <laughs> exhausted means when you analyze certain objects in the con field of convention, you know, conventional truth, then you may be able to talk about it, say a lot of things about it. But as and when you talk about the more profound teachings like shunyata, then your mind gets immediately exhausted. You don't have the capacity to go further, you see. Right? So that's the meaning. So therefore, The ordinary logicians are ordinary individuals who try to understand things in this limited way. So therefore, they don't have the capacity to, to know the mind and the teaching. Then the next verse, verse number seven. Verse number seven is showing or trying to prove and establish the unique or excellent qualities of the Mayana teaching. Because it is vast. In the Mayana teaching, as we already discussed, it shows a profound method and vast method, both the profound and vast method to accumulate the two types of collections, merit and wisdom to actualize that unsurpassing supreme enlightenment. And this is very special because when you follow this vast method, you develop a special capacity to measure the mind of sentient beings because the mind of sentient beings are so varied, so varied. I mean, if you just talk to 10, 20 people or live with 20 people, you will, you will see how different their mental dispositions are. Very difficult to please, you see. So therefore, Buddha came up with this amazing, you know, vast method to tame the diverse mental dispositions of sentient beings, because it is vast and profound. It thoroughly measures, so because it has this vast method, it's able to measure the mind of sentient beings. And because of its teaching on the profound, you're able to help them reach the non-conceptual state. Ordinary people get stuck with the conceptions, discursive thoughts. And for realizing emptiness directly and so forth, you need to transcend that conceptual level and develop the non-conceptual state. Let your mind merge with the shunyata as we say, like putting water in water, or like putting your mind on, on the space where you don't see the subject-object difference, right? Therefore, these conceptions are, as, as, as Atisha says in his name of the path to enlightenment, that conceptions are a great ignorance. And it is these conceptions, including the conception that sees things as having independent existence, that sentient beings are thrown into this big ocean of suffering, ocean of samsara. And it is by remaining in a meditative state where there's no conception, then you reach that conception-free state, which is really like space. Just like in the case of space, it gives you so much room. So similarly, when you transcend that conception, level of conception, and enter into the non-conceptuality, 
you get so much space. And there's nothing to grasp, no reason to get stuck, right? We get stuck, we get obsessed because of conceptions of likes and dislikes and so forth, exaggerations, denigrations and so forth, right? So because it is vast and profound, it thoroughly matures and it is non-conceptual. Therefore, from here it teaches the true and that is the unsurprising means. <clears throat> so what is being, what will be taught primarily is uh, that these two the vast method and the profound emptiness will be taught. Now as to the opposition that the Mahayana is not a proper method. This is refuted by saying, number one, the reason for abandoning the Mahayana teaching should be understood and discarded. And one should also note the reason that you discard Mahayana teaching is the fault of the person and not fault of the Dharma, not fault of Mahayana teaching. Therefore, it is improper to discard the Mahayana teaching. So therefore, in the next line, next verse, verse number eight, beings will be tormented by fearing that which is not the object of fear. See? We fear which is not the object of fear. Mahayana teaching is not an object of fear, but we fear, unfortunately. There are many areas in our life. We do not fear where we should have fear, but fear where we should not have any fear. This is I'm an ordinary, you know, way. That's why that's why how that's how we get stuck in the samsara. So here it is saying that those who do not show interest in the Mayana teaching, and those who have a inferior kind of lower lineage. They develop this fear to the Mahayana teaching. And because of this fear, they defame, say negative things against the Mahayana teaching. It's not only with the Mahayana teaching, you see. Now, I don't recall that quotation properly from some other Western thinker who said that it's the fear which makes you say all the bad things to people and things like that. Right? So therefore here also it says that those people who do not have the Mayana lineage, right, and who have no interest in the Mayana teaching, then they develop fear to, to this Mayana teaching, which is not an object of fear. And then because of this fear, they deny great it. And as a result, they will fall into the negative state of existence because they've accumulated a great heap of negative deeds. Beings will be tormented, tormented. That means because of your wrong attitude towards the Mayana teaching, you will be tormented. By fearing that which is not the object of fear, will collect, the reason is because you collect great non meritorious deeds and for a long duration, you will suffer in that uh, hell realm. Now the reason is, number one, because you have no lineage of the Mayana teaching. So at this time also, if you show more interest in the Mayana teaching, you know, study and so forth, then you will be able to leave an imprint to come into that, into the fold of the Mayana teaching. Okay. Because of no lineage, number one. Or because of association with bad friends. Right? So in our in our ordinary life also, with what kind of people you should associate is very, very, very important. Because if you 
associate with a bad friend, it's very easy to pick up the bad habits of their, those friends. Very easy. In, Tibet, in Tibetan, we say that if you recline against a uh, mountain, gold mountain, gold dust will stick to you. If you rec recline against a mountain of dust, the dust will stick to you. <laughs> so similarly, you know, you need to be very careful with, with, with whom you are associating. Now, that is not to say that you should not, you should make a discrimin discrimination and not talk to some people. Of course, you can talk to other people, but you should always make sure that not, you are not influenced by their wrong ways of life, wrong ways of thinking, you know. Bad friends will also, not necessarily right in the beginning, come as a very bad friend. They will also come to you as a very good friend, right? They may give you money, they will take you, you know, uh, a place to watch a movie, you know, give you nice food and all those things. But through their way of life, if they gradually take you to the same process of life that they're leading, right? As is said in the 37 Bodhisattva practices, about bad friend and good friend. And it said, when you associate with somebody, if your negative emotions are increasing, that means you are associating with the bad friend. When you associate with somebody, if your positive qualities like loving kindness and compassion are increasing, then clearly you are associating with good friends. Negative, so-called negative friends will not come like a ghost or you know, with horns on their head and you know, things like that, right? So it's very important. We are ordinary people. We, we don't have that integrity. So we can easily be taken into the wrong path by associating with bad friends. So that's why relying upon a good teacher, making friendship with good Dharma practitioners is a very, very important, okay? because of no lineage, bad friends, and not accumulated virtue before, see? If you're somebody who has not accumulated virtue, then it's very easy for you to go into the wrong way. If you're somebody who, who has already been habituated with, with good things, you will not easily give it up, right? So you can see some people who will, you know, some people go into the direction of Dharma, some people will go into some other direction, you know? depending upon what friends you have, depending upon in what area you are associated. So habituated is also the way. And not trained the mind. When your mind is not trained, your mind is like clueless, right? When your mind has no stand, then you will be taken into all directions because you don't have your personal integrity, personal stand, likes and dislikes. Then you will just randomly follow anybody. So therefore, it is important to train the mind and to see the good as good, bad as bad, right? So train the mind. This teaching will frighten them and here they will fall from the great purpose. So if my inner teachings frighten them because of these reasons, and then if they don't follow the my inner teaching, go into some other wrong direction, then you, they have missed a great purpose, great, great opportunity, right? Great opportunity, because the core teaching of Mahayana is how to benefit all sentient beings, which is so important in today's world. Mahayana teachings are not only talking about the well-being of human beings, but, but, but all sentient beings, right? But then, then see, you know, today, Forget about all sentient beings. Even among human beings, we are not able to live harmoniously. We are just, just displaying our weapons, destructive nuclear weapons, threatening each other, bomb each other, you know. Unfortunately, this is our state, right? Right? 
So, so then you, you really will become inferior or low person. It doesn't matter you have a lot of money. It doesn't matter you may be very famous. But your, your thinking is narrow, selfish. And don't consider the well-being of others, many others. Then you are definitely following the wrong path and missing a great, great opportunity. Okay. So, stop here. Ask some questions. Well, it's uh, as you say, Gishila. Mm. We are ready to listen to you. <laughs> Huh? In we, are, we are ready to listen to you indefinitely, but uh, we have some questions already. So if you yeah. want to answer questions, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a moment. Uh, first, uh, it's not a question per se. Uh, it's the answer to your question. Uh, if a non-Buddhist can realize emptiness. And mm. Igor says that... Uh, didn't the Dalai Lama answer this question already? Uh, he said that uh, a non-Buddhist can achieve enlightenment, but it will take much more time to achieve it for a non-Buddhist than for a Buddhist. Are you sure he's only said this? <laughs> I don't know. It's... Uh, no, no, that's a different, that I think is a different context. You know, in Buddhism, we have this teaching where we say we all have Buddha nature. Okay. So, somewhere down in the line, we'll all get enlightened. That's a general description. His Holiness might have said that. Okay. But what I'm saying is, if you don't follow the Buddhist philosophy, Simply use your intelligence and try to understand the ultimate truth or whatever. Is it possible for them to realize emptiness directly? Because in the text we just read, it says it will be difficult just by using logic, you know, to realize emptiness directly. <laughs> so anyway, give more thought to it, yeah. Uh, and, and then a question from Igor, actually. Um, in Tantra, uh, the concepts are removed by using the method of dissolving the winds in the central channel. Mm. And uh, how are concepts removed in the Mahayana Sutra? The concepts are removed by, reali by, by realizing that things do not have inherent independent existence. Right? The conceptions, the diverse discursive thoughts and conceptions arise because of our, you know, grasping and craving the object, getting obsessed with the object, seeing it as beautiful, seeing it as ugly, you know. So we get stuck there. But when you really, really, not just talking, but when you really realize the lack of inherent existence, in other words, the fluidity of the nature of everything, there is there there is nothing to nothing to hold on to. The conception, you know, conception means the conception of something. When there's nothing to hold on to, the conceptions will naturally cease. As I said, you know, the mind emerging, mind the, the, the mind, when the mind directly sees emptiness, it is said to be like water, you know, part of water put in another part. And once they put the water mixed together, you can't separate it. And the best example that the Buddha himself gave us when he was asked, what is the best example you can ex ex explain the realization of emptiness? He, he explained that this is like mind merging with space. Right? And then just, just like the, the experience taught in Tantra, you know, where, where the one of the fundamental uh, method that they use is developing the bliss. And when the, when the mind is very bliss, it becomes conception free. The more we are unhappy, the more we have conceptions. The more we are happy, especially happy with yourself, 
There's nothing much to discuss, you know. Everything's okay, you see. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, Gishnala, the next question is from Bayarma. Uh, she asks, um, what does it mean uh, to think non-conceptually? Think non-conceptually. Like in the case of the Buddha, when you get enlightened, complete enlightened, he doesn't have to think. It, it comes automatically, effortlessly. Like, like for example, the, the, the reflection of a moon can be seen in the water. Is it necessary for the water to have a conception saying that I will reflect the moon? Right? So, so long as you have this receptivity and clarity, things will come into it without making any effort. That's why the, the human mind is compared like a mirror. Right? The mirror, the mirror doesn't have to think that I will let this person face come into my <laughs> right so whatever whatever comes within the purview of that mirror it's reflected it doesn't have to think that i'll now make the tree appear now i'll make the person appear he doesn't have to make any effort but still it can come you see so I think it's something like that. Okay. Yes, thank you, Gishela. Um, the next question is from Veronica. Mm. And she says, I often experience a state of depression. Um, and in this, in this state, I feel uh, I have like a dark pressing feeling in the area of the heart. Mm. And recently I read uh, that in Tibet there is a concept uh, of, of a bad energy, which is uh, described like this. Mm. Um, the book suggests that uh, when you feel this, you have to distract one, uh, yourself with something um, which is pleasant mm. when this feeling appears. But uh, when I tried to do this, um, I understood that... Uh, you know, I cannot achieve it. I cannot think of anything uh, pleasant. So uh, how can I uh, deal with uh, such a depressed state? Um, and uh, what shall I do when I feel it? Because it's a, it's a very big obstacle on, on my path. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so the, the reason we do practice of mindfulness and meditation is to improve the clarity of the mind, right? Ignorance has always been compared to darkness. The more your mind becomes dull, the more the mind sinks, the more you get this sense of darkness. So similarly, when you get depressed also, you know, your mind goes withdrawn. Then you see the darkness. On ordinary occasions, when you when you withdraw your mind, then you fall asleep and things like that. Again, experience of some kind of darkness, right? And uh, so here, like in the meditation, we say that when you do a, for example, meditation, when your mind becomes very dull. And in, in some cases, so dull that you start falling into sleep. So there, are the, the, the counterforce to this practice is just to get up, go for a walk, wash your face, you know, take a cup of coffee or you know, things like that. So similarly here also, you know, you do, do something, you know, going out and into you know, uh, a garden or uh, something that is cheerful, 
you don't you don't need to tell the mind oh you be cheerful you know it may not work but but make sure that you are in a surrounding which is uplifting so that it will that itself will make some impact on it because the mind we always compare mind to to the monkey you know monkey mind you know so you you need to play this trick you can't force it but you play some trick so that the mind gets into something else okay Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kishila. Um, uh, the next question is from, uh, uh, it's, it's not actually a question probably from Vera. Um, she gives an example uh, that uh, her teacher uh, of physics at the university shared an experience, his experience with uh, the students. Uh, he said that studying physics, uh, he came to God. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is a kind of an example of uh, the relativity theory. Uh, when you sit in the car and look uh, through the window, um, and uh, you see that uh, the the uh, the things around you are moving, but how do you understand that? Uh, do you move or do they move? Actually, it's <laughs> it's just uh, it's, it was not a question. Actually, probably it's yeah, just yeah, a yeah. thought. Yeah, yeah this, this is what is explained in Einstein's theory of relativity also. Yeah, true. So, so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So things are dependent on, that's, that's why we say relative, you see. So in relation to whether you are moving or the, you know, the, 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 the external, you know, surrounding is moving, you know, something like what we say, you know, optical illusion, you see. So different experiences will be there. And the mind, the brain itself is said to be very easy to be, you know, fooled. You see, so you can you easily get fooled unless you have a very strong grasp of the reality. You can easily be so. So that's why we live in a world of illusion. Samsara is nothing but a world of illusion. And we try to get happiness by living in this world of illusion. Now today you get more illusion because of this very very you know clever technological inventions they're so so the inventions are so powerful so strong that you you can get very easily hallucinated you see right so we are under kind of double or triple illusion <laughs> uh, thank you very much Gishila. the next question is from dinara um uh, she asks, uh, could you please explain um, what is uh, actually uh, the mental uh, consciousness, this sixth consciousness or sixth mind? Is it the conceptual and subtle mind or, or subtle mind? Um, it, it is both conception and non-conception, both. And, 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 and how, uh, how can we understand uh, or realize emptiness without conceptual mind? Because without it, we become kind of unreasonable yeah, and cannot function. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So gradually start from conception and then gradually go into non-conception. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the, the next question is from Sergei. Um, he says, uh, if a scientist or a scholar follows the path of uh, Pratika Buddhas at the time when the Buddha's teachings are not available, uh, he, can he uh, uh, realize Shunyata directly? I don't know. This is similar to the question that I asked before. <laughs> So you need to find that answer. It's it's a kind of a statement. Do you agree with it or not? <laughs> huh? It's a kind of a statement that he probably can realize it directly, can't he? But but according to the Buddhist teaching, Sarvakas or Partika Buddhas also follow the Buddha's teaching. You know, the only thing that is said is that they made this promise that maybe be able to, you know, uh, 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 you know, give teaching and follow teaching even at the time when there is no Buddha. But this this is not saying that they, they don't follow the Buddha's teaching. They follow the Buddha's teaching. But the question I asked was somebody who don't follow any of the Buddha's teaching. 
So it's a little bit different. Okay. Yes, Gishela, uh, uh, next we would like to take a question from Saheli. Please mm. unmute yourself. Mm. Uh, so, so the uh, question is uh, like when we are living in a metro city and when we are living in a, some uh, solitary place, we really can, uh, I, mean, I can see the difference in the mental formation I can have like always in a metro city after leaving uh, for a few months, all this negative emotions arises very quickly. Like I mm. try to control, but it arises. But whenever I have observed that I'm in a solitary place, uh, then it it's completely nothing, nothing, no negative emotion arises. Mm. So mm. there is when I'm in a complete calm position also, like I have calm mindset, uh, then there is a slightest fear always arises in my mind that if I go back again, this mm. negative emotion will come again. And the same thing happened with the health issues also. Like when mm. I'm completely healthy, uh, mm. I have a little bit of fear that what will happen if I fall sick again? So mm. how to deal with this kind of fear? It's not that the fear is completely uh, take. I mean, overtaking my thoughts. It's not that, but there is a fear. I always feel that. Mm. So how to deal with this kind of fear? So, so, so therefore, therefore, in Buddhism, we are repeatedly asked to do, you know, study and practice and meditation. So by, by, so strongly that whichever place or you are or with whoever you associate, you are able to remain undisturbed. Right? So there are, there are a few things. One, if that place is very conducive, particular place is very conducive for your health, for your practice, and then if there is a possibility for you to continuously stay there, stay there. That's number one choice. But because of other factors, you know, your work or your study and other factors, you cannot always stay there. Then the second thing that you should do is you, you, are, you are compelled to go back to your city where you have work and other things you are compelled to do. But occasionally come back to those places where you, you know, where, where, where you can get recharged. I mean, these are the ordinary practices. Then in the long run, you should train your mind, equip your mind in such a way that wherever you are, you are not affected. That is possible. And especially, especially, you know, <laughs> one thing is for, for to achieve success in your practice, you can't just keep on avoiding people, okay? One, of course, if you do like Milarepa, he, he did that, he would keep on avoiding people, moving from mountain to mountain, things like that, that we may not be able to do that. And uh, so, so in that case, you know, you are, you are unfortunately or fortunately compelled to mix with people, go to different surrounding situations. But you need to develop this internal kind of strength so that you are able to take care of yourself wherever you are. That really is the key thing. You are able to take care of yourself. And also, you also don't become so susceptible to fears as we already discuss, discussed, right? So sometimes, you know, the fear kills you. It may not be true that you just go back to your home and you'll get sick, you know? The reason is there are like millions of people living there in the big city, not just you. When they are okay, why, why you are not okay? So sometimes, so many a times, it may be your thought also, you see. So change your thought also. But at the same time, you know, uh, we are ordinary people. So we might be influenced by that unhealthy surrounding. So therefore, occasionally for recharging your battery, you go to those small you know, places where there is solitude, where you are able to strengthen yourself, you know, in terms of your physical health, as well as mental health, strengthen yourself. And then when you are fine, then go to back to those places where you need to go. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Gisela. Um, uh, we have one more question from Nika. Um, uh, she 
says that sometimes uh, in or maybe maybe did, did you have such examples in your life or in Sangha uh, when uh, someone who is close to the guru or teacher uses his or her power, power maliciously uh, in an attempt to separate the this other disciples from the guru, the teacher, mm -hmm. how to forgive uh, such persons who saw discord in the Sangha and who enjoy their power and close relationship with the guru, uh, separating the others from the guru and how to find uh, peace of mind in this situation. So the one thing is you need to see the meaninglessness of samsara and and uh, don't get obsessed with anything that is within samsara, whether it is in the name of guru or in the name of student, whoever, you know, husband, wife, whoever. You should, one thing that you should really realize is these are all ordinary people. You don't have to see your teacher as a Buddha and things like that. Be realistic, you know. And judge, the, I mean, see that person according to how he behaves or how she behaves. Not, not just imagining that he may be Buddha or things like that. Okay. Let me tell you one story. Once somebody came to me, a little bit depressed, a woman, who said she was uh, sexually exploited by her teacher. So she was in a helpless situation and came to me and she said, because you, you speak English and you are very open, so you, you can help me, please talk to me. Then I said, this, this so-called your teacher, was he very good to you in the beginning? He said, yes, he, he was very good. He, I learned many things from him. Now I have this problem and I also married, I have my husband. So what should I do? Then I said, now for the time being, the greatest problem is not with your teacher, but how you are you know, seen by your husband, if he knows about it. <laughs> then, then she said, my husband knows it, but he is very understanding. Then I said, lucky, you are lucky. That's the biggest problem because you, you either have to get divorced from your husband or you have to live with him. So if that husband is understanding and still loves you, that is wonderful. Now with the second problem, with the teacher, I said, you should be realistic because he has been very kind, very good. You learn many things from him. That part, you should be thankful mentally. Now at this stage, because of his behavior, you can't live with him. So you don't have to tie your neck to that person continuously and also don't have to fight if that is not necessary, right? So you part your way, don't, no need to continue to stay with that person. So something like that, be realistic. The most important thing is right in the beginning, before you make any connection with any teacher, any other human being, be it husband, wife relation, boyfriend, girlfriend relation, or teacher, student relation, before you make the connection, you must be very careful. It is here we make the mistake. You know, that person looks good, you married to that person, the teacher looks good, you, start saying, oh, this is my teacher, you know, you start advertising that, that how great he is, how great she is, you know, the honeymoon period, you see, right? So right in the beginning, be very careful. But somehow we are all ordinary human beings. If, if something unfortunate happens, then from that time onwards, you just severe your relationship. There's no need to tie your neck to that person, right? And yes, you are right, it happens. I've, I've, I've heard about many people having such problems, right? So therefore, therefore we have a saying in, a, in, a Tibet, in Tibetan, we have a saying that the blessing of Lama is greater from a distance. <laughs> so therefore I always recommend people that His Holiness be your guru, you know, because he's, he's well known, he's kind teacher and you don't have the access continuously to that person very easily. So it's very safe. But when you come very close to somebody, then as ordinary human being, we can come with all these problems. You start seeing his fault, her fault, you know, things like that. Okay. So if it is a small minor fault, you have to accept it because we are all ordinary human beings. But if it's a major kind of uh, intolerable kind of situation, then I think the best is you part your ways. 
Ishila, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, what what to do if uh, it's not the fault of the guru, but someone from uh, his entourage, someone who just doesn't want the others to be close to the guru or teacher, how to deal with them? Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. So, so I think in that case also, you should see whether you can talk about this to the teacher. You know, sometimes, sometimes if such, such, I mean, it depends on many situations, it's difficult to answer. For example, sometimes you can be tough and the straight way tell that person why you are making this. Many times you can't talk to that person because you don't want to pick a fight and things like that. Then if it is possible to share this to the teacher, share it to the teacher, things like that. And if the situation is bad, then again, I think the best way is not to continue to stay there. That's also, there's so many ways. Sometimes it is better to speak, sometimes it's not better to speak. So you need to see the situation. Mm 